tonight we're going to get as far as we can into the uh, hold on just a second for some reason ah there we go uh, <clears throat> we're going to start with events leading up to the declaration of the bob and include as much of that story as we can but rather than uh, either hurt, scurry through this very important beginning of the Baha'i faith, uh, want to be sure we hooked up together all the things we had gotten to before we uh, had several classes dealing with various axioms related to the overview we are trying to achieve with our study of not just the Baha'i faith, but the Baha'i faith in the context of the sequence of the Abrahamic religions. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> so, uh, we will probably get to part of the Declaration of the Bob, maybe not, but we'll continue it next week, which uh, should be, uh, have some lovely uh, slides, and we're going to include uh, uh, next week uh, a nice uh, short video of the House of the Bob before it was destroyed. Before we begin, I wanted to give you a, a little uh, uh, insert here, uh, just a reminder about maintaining your axiom box. Now, what is your axiom box? Well, it's, uh, as the, they say in uh, Old English, it's your, uh, your, the skull of your, where your brain resides. Uh, the axiom box is, in effect, the idea that you retain these axioms that we've been talking about. So when you're dealing with a particular item or issue or question regarding religion in general or the Baha'i faith in particular, you don't have to rebuild your argument, at least not in your own mind. Maybe when you're giving a talk, you do. And so some of the foundational building blocks uh, uh, that we're talking about is, for example, the proof of the existence of God. Well, uh, uh, you can do that uh, indirectly or directly, and you can do that, uh, the, your belief in God may come after you've seen the evidence of God working in history, which is what we're doing. Uh, the proof of the eternal covenant, which we have been studying, and you can do that with seeing how each manifestation acknowledges the previous uh, manifestation, predicts the coming of the next one, and so on. So you see that continuity, and you don't have to keep re uh, proving it to yourself. Though when you pick up the Quran for the first time, you may uh, uh, have to study the evidence, uh, which is plentiful that he is indeed saying what we've been discussing, that he is the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy and that he acknowledges the divinity of Christ and so on. Uh, the proof of the Bob is Kaim, which is what we're going to start doing tonight, uh, and so on. So the idea is these are foundational concepts, and once you've established those, then you build on that. So uh, when you come across this, uh, um, I don't know if there's a particular passage in the writings. I think there is, but I've heard it from uh, I taught by a hand of the cause, uh, Abu Qasim Faizi, who says that you, you should never take a single passage from the Baha'i writings, a single statement of fact or uh, out of context. And what is that context? Well, ultimately, that context is the entirety of the revelation of Baha'u'llah and all the other authoritative teachings and documents in the faith. So uh, you can box yourself into some misinformation and to some uh, erroneous thinking if you don't uh, maintain your axiom box, okay? Uh, your brain pan. So we're going to begin with Picking up where we left off, but moving through this quickly, because we're going to repeat a little bit of where we left off with Islam, and particularly the eschatological terms associated with the new era. And of course, an era, as we've said before, means the same as a dispensation. So what were the signs of the time of the end, uh, the last judgment, the resurrection of the dead, the beginning and the end? 
uh, the day of days, all of these are some of the terms, just a few of them that are spoken of in the Quran repeatedly that would mark, uh, according to the fundamentalist uh, Islamists uh, or uh, Muslims, uh, whether in Sunni or Shia, as I've said before, uh, that uh, there would be the end of time, the end of the earth, and Christ would appear, the reappearance of Christ. Uh, interestingly, uh, and judge the quick and the dead. Very much the same, as I've said before, with fundamentalist uh, Christian thought. So we're going to see what those mean. So uh, we've gone through most of them, but let me go through them very quickly. The time of the end is, of course, the end uh, of time or the end of the earth, according to fundamentalist thinking. Um, Baha'u'llah in the Book of Certitude explains that means the end of an era, or in this case, uh, more importantly with the declaration of the Bab, the end of the prophetic cycle and the beginning of the Baha'i cycle. Judgment is something that occurs every with every new era, and that is the people of the uh, who are the followers of the previous revelation are judged as to whether or not they recognize and follow the next manifestation. Uh, resurrection of the dead, of course, is taken literally by fundamentalist Christian thought and Muslim thought, uh, means, of course, the awakening of those who are spiritually dead. Beginning and the end we've discussed before. This is something Baha'u'llah discusses at length in the uh, Book of Certitude, where he says that in the same way Christ says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, each manifestation is the beginning of, uh, is the end of, or the end point of the previous revelation uh, and the beginning of a new revelation. And the day of days, of course, is specifically referring to this particular time in history, unique in all of the periods in world history that has never be, uh, occurred before and never will occur again. It's the point of recognition of the overall uh, purpose of God's eternal covenant, and that is a global kingdom of God on earth. And so that's why this day is more important uh, than any other day that has occurred. If we're talking of days as eras or dispensation, it is the time, as, uh, as stated in the by writings, of the maturation of humankind, that we now understand who we are. We've come of age, as it were. And it's a very good analogy to uh, an individual coming of age, that before this, and, and of course, we are now in the throes of the end of adolescence, where we are, uh, uh, the, the planet is all pimply and doesn't know, <laughs> it's very confused. Uh, why aren't we studying present day Islam? Uh, because we're not going to. And the reason is the same reason that we did not examine the various forms of contemporary Judaism, our contemporary Christianity, uh, that these religions are long past. And I, this is condescending, and I probably shouldn't say it, but shelf life. But by that, I mean they were intended to endure until the next manifestation come, when the, uh, comes when the religion is stretched out are employed beyond that, it becomes um, contradictory within itself and it becomes uh, a bane on the existence of the next revelation. Uh, these religions had no enduring covenant nor were they meant to. Uh, Islam had an enduring covenant, but it was not inviolable uh, or proved not to be so because it was violated. Uh, we will not examine the myriad forms of contemporary Islam. Uh, because while the Quran remains an accurate repository, and as we studied many, many classes ago, the only uh, reliable repository of the revealed word of God, uh, other than the Babi and Baha'i writings. The forms of the religious law, the institutions and practices bear on the incidental resemblance to anything Muhammad had in mind. In other words, contemporary Islam is, will tell you nothing about what Muhammad intended or very little. 
this doesn't mean there aren't Muslims who are extremely learned and who understand this and who uh, many are very receptive to the Baha'i understanding, principally because we recognize the station of Muhammad, agree that the Quran is the word of God, and agree uh, that progressive revelation, which is articulated, uh, as we've noted before, throughout the Quran, is a foundational axiom or verity about religion. So uh, if you're talking then uh, in conclusion about what is the revelation of Muhammad, it consists of three sources. The, the Quran itself, which reveals the revelatory process. And, uh, and of course it has the collection of surah, uh, it, the structure of the Quran we've talked about before, the themes, the laws and interpretations. Uh, and then the Hadith, which are the statements of Muhammad attributed to him and written down. Uh, and some of them are deemed authoritative, some are not. And they are in various collections, some that are authenticated and uh, those that are mutually accepted by Sunni and Shia alike. Then there's the Sunnah, which means the pattern of life of Muhammad. Uh, the recorded and recollected reflections on the comportment and specific habits and actions of the prophet, habitual practices of Muhammad, his pattern of living. And these become informative even as uh, many Christians look to the pattern of life that Christ lived in, in addition to his laws uh, and exhortations but the, the way he responded to others in a, the loving manner and so on. That's the Sunnah of Christ. So Islamic chronology simplified, uh, and I'm not going to go over these, but they'll be on the PowerPoint or the PDF file that will be with the recorded version of this. But uh, so we'll go through them uh, pretty quickly, but you have the first four, uh, um, in, uh, caliphs uh, after the prophet Muhammad. So you, uh, that last he dies in 632. You have the four rightly guided caliphs, uh, caliphs meaning these were ca uh, caliphs who uh, knew Muhammad, were part of were, uh, his companions. And then you have several dynasties, the Umayyad dynasty, the Abbasid dynasty, uh, the decline of that dynasty, uh, the Malmuk Sultanate, uh, the Maluk, excuse me, Sultanate, and then finally the Ottoman Empire, the one that endured the longest. And of course, that's the one which lasts until 1923. And this is the one that was in effect when Baha'u'llah uh, was exiled to the um, uh, territory of the Ottoman Empire in Baghdad. Persia was not part of the uh, that. So in these... Um, the conquest, uh, Islam spread, as you can see, uh, until the, through the uh, Umayyad and the Abbasid uh, caliphates uh, into Spain, even up into France, uh, and so on. And there are various uh, interesting stories about uh, um, uh, Islam and uh, as it contested the Byzantine and, and uh, destroyed ultimately or overtook the Byzantine empire, uh, overtook Spain and then was expelled from Spain and so on. So uh, we've already been through that. We're not gonna go through it again, but what we end up with then are various branches of Sunni Islam, the dominant uh, uh, denomination or sect of Islam. Uh, the, under the caliphate. So you have uh, Sunni Islam, and then I'm not gonna try to pronounce these and you don't have to either, but this shows you how many different branches there are of uh, Sunni Islam. Same thing with Shia Islam. These are all the branches uh, and these are subsets of some and so on. So you can see in the same way that we showed that, uh, and we showed it uh, uh, one with Islam too, those charts that show the branches of uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam. And so these are the branches of Sufism. So Sufism itself, 
itself is an is sec, but there are various kinds of Sufism. Uh, and so these are the list of the various branches of Sufi orientation. Of course, Sufism, uh, of course, is very important to understand. And of course, the first, um, some of the first writings of Baha'u'llah, Revelation of Baha'u'llah, was to the Sufis that he had met who adored him, who loved him very much when he was in his two year. Uh, uh, stay in Suleimaniye and uh, made friends with the Sufis in a monastery there and uh, they didn't want him to leave. And so the uh, writings of the um, um, Seven Valleys, the Four Valleys, these are two Sufis who in effect had asked him questions and he wrote them in the uh, style and manner of Sufi uh, literature about the various stages of spiritual development. What becomes important, as we will see later on, is the idea of Sufism underlying the central uh, approach of it to religion is that it's individualistic. It does not believe in a religious institution. It's very much like Pauline Christianity, that your religion is between you and God and you don't need an institution to, to do that. And so you, in effect, try to achieve union with God or unity with God. Uh, um, this too, you can look at on your own, but here I have uh, uh, included a chart showing the basic differences between Sunni and Shi'i belief, including jurisprudence, which you can see down here, uh, there are various schools of Judas, uh, Judas, uh, jurisprudence. Uh, so you can look at that uh, on the slides. Uh, we're not going to spend our time because, again, we're finishing up our study of Islam, except for a, a little bit here on what happens to Shia Islam in, in this sense. Naturally, since the Bab is say, states that he is the return of the 12th Imam, we need to know what that means. And we've spoken a little bit about it, but let's go into a little more detail. Number one, we want to know why uh, the major part of Shiism is in Persia, because originally Persia was overtaken by uh, Sunni Muslims, as was most of the Middle East. Uh, and so uh, the first thing you need to know is that Shi'i becomes really broken away from Sunni Islam. In other words, you have, you really don't have Shi'i Islam as a separate thing in the beginning. Remember that Ali himself, the first cousin and, and first lieutenant of Muhammad uh, and who married Muhammad's daughter Fatima was the fourth imam uh, himself, I mean, the, not the fourth imam, he was the first imam, he was the fourth caliph. So you had kind of an attempt to unify these factions. And as we've seen before, it wasn't successful, but the official schism, if you will, occurred even before Ali. And this is with the third imam, uh, and that is uh, Imam Hussein, uh, and the Battle of Karbala, and we've mentioned this before, because he becomes so important in the history of the Babi and Baha'i faith, uh, and we'll see why. Um, so the second part is the differentiation and distinction of the Shi of Shi'i as a separate sect within the Muslim community and the opposition of the Sunni caliphates uh, or, or caliphs. And so most of the imams after this point are killed by or on behalf of the various caliphs who don't want that sect to survive. Uh, so as you can see, this starts after the Battle of Karbala. And you have the formation of specific uh, Shia states. Uh, and so that third section is, or the third division, if you will, in the evolution of Shiism. Uh, is the development of these states. And again, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but you can see them listed here. Uh, and um, 
then the history of Shia uh, Islam in Persia, how did Persia become uh, Shia Islam? Uh, you have uh, uh, the evolution of, or the development of uh, Iran, first of all, as you can see here, formerly a Sunni majority underwent a process of forced conversion to Shia Islam under the Safavids between 16th and 18th century. The process also ensured the dominance of the 12 or sect within Shiism. Uh, and what does that mean? That there were various, as we saw, various sects of Shiism. The 12 or sect means those who believe in the 12 Imams. And so that was the dominant Shiite sect. Uh, uh, and this, again, you can look at on your own. Uh, it's a, a beautiful uh, display of the uh, lineal descent from Muhammad and how the various uh, 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 sects of Islam were formed. And here you see down here the Twelver sect. And you see the, that well, one of the others that's interesting is the Druze. And of course, uh, the Druze villages are in the Holy Land and one's very near to Akka. And indeed, it was in the Druze village that the Baha'is went during the First World War in order to be protected. And they got along very well, uh, were very well received by them. So the Safa, uh, Safavid Empire, and you can see this was spelled differently here, but it's all uh, an attempt to... Uh, uh, translate the uh, Persian into, or the Arabic into English. Uh, and the uh, empire in Persia then is, uh, occupies the whole of, uh, of Persia. And at the time you can see that Baghdad, which became a later part of the, uh, uh, in, uh, the um, uh, Ottoman Empire. And of course, the pink outlines you see here, these are the contemporary states. So this is Persia here outlined. This would be Iraq here. Uh, and then up here, you've got Azerbaijan and so on. And this would be, uh, let's see, Syria here and uh, Turkey here. So who were the 12 Imams? Well, you've seen this before, and I'm not going to spend much time with you on this either. You have the, all of the uh, uh, Imams were killed. Uh, and uh, so the, the first Imam again, Ali, who uh, I mean, uh, was the first Imam and the fourth Caliph. And then the Battle of Karbala is uh, concerned with Hossein. Uh, and his name is very important uh, because, of course, uh, and, and the, a number of reasons. One is that the first intimation of his revelation by the Bab, he envisioned himself imbibing the blood from dripping from the severed head of Hossein. And this was in Karbala, and we'll see more about that later. And so you have... Uh, uh, Baha'u'llah's name is uh, Sayyid Hus uh, Hussein Ali, or not Sayyid, uh, Mirza Hussein Ali, which is using this Imam and this Imam uh, in the same way that uh, um, all right, hold on here, okay. Um, Now, we come down here to the 12th Imam, and this is where we get into the events leading up to the declaration of the Bab in this sense. Of course, this was uh, almost a, a, a thousand years before, but uh, which is why the Bab says, you waited for me for a thousand years. He's talking about <clears throat> for the return of the uh, hidden Imam, as he's called. Now, you have two things uh, that are you need to know about the hidden imam. First of all, realizing what had happened to all the previous imams, namely they were killed, 
he secluded himself, and that's called the minor uh, occultation. Uh, occultation means uh, that, that he's hidden, he's concealed. That's from 873 to 941. Um, and the minor occultation, he was hidden, but there were uh, four, um, excuse me, I'm not doing well with this tonight. All right. Uh, the minor occultation, there were four uh, gates or deputies or intermediaries who would uh, meet with him and convey to the rest of the Shiite community what his instructions or what his writings were. So throughout his disappearance, the 12th Iman was believed to have communicated with the outside world through this series of deputies who took the title Gate or Bob. Uh, and these lasted up until 941 when the last of these uh, did not leave uh, a successor, uh, an, another gate. Uh, so it was believed that God himself would appoint the next successor. And of course, Babis and Baha'is believed that this was the Bab. Uh, and this period is known as the uh, uh, major occultation, and that is between 941, the death of the fourth gate, and the beginning of the Baha'i faith or the declaration of the Bab in 1844. And so this is the when the hidden Imam would re, would return. A few days before the death of the fourth uh, uh, deputy or gate in 941, the hidden Imam is believed to have sent his followers a letter in which he declared the beginning of major occultation. During this time, the Mahdi was not to be in contact with his followers directly, but had instructed them to follow the pious high clerics for whom he had designated specific distinguishing attributes. And so you have the Shia expectation of the coming of the return of this 12th Imam. And it's the same thing as Christians believing in the return of Christ. Uh, and of course, there are two returns spoken of in the gospel. One was the comforter, which would come uh, soon. And then the time of the end, uh, the second coming, which is spoken about most uh, importantly in the book of John. Well, the Shia expectation was the same thing. Shia Muslims believe that it was the Prophet Muhammad's intention <clears throat> that his descendants inherit the spiritual and temporal leadership of the Muslim faith and that these leaders be called Imams. Of course, that we've known for a while. They were believed to be infallible. That's something we've mentioned before, but well worth repeating. So in effect, they had somewhat the same status uh, as did, the, say, the guardian as appointed by Abdul Baha. They had what is called in the Baha'i writings, conferred infallibility. However, the last Shia Imam, the 12th in line, had withdrawn into hiding in 873, hoping to avoid the fate of his predecessors, as we just mentioned, namely, not get killed. It is believed that he will appear again to bring in the end times. And this is what eschatology is about, the end times. And of course, as Baha'is, we know that the end times are really the beginning of a glorious time. Muslims have called this promised deliverer the Mahdi, the guided one, or the Qa'im, he who will arise. And it means arise in the line of Muhammad. And of course, the green turban that the Bob wore, as we will discover, is a signal of the fact that he was a Sayyid or a lineal descendant of Muhammad. Baha'is believe that the Bob is the fulfillment of this prophecy. So uh, now we get into uh, another. Um, theme about the appearance of the Bab. So in other words, we've sort of finished the link between Islam and the advent of the Bab. But one thing that's very interesting, uh, I find in uh, Baha'u'llah's discussion, he discusses this in full in the first hundred or so pages of the 
uh, the Kitabi Egan, the Book of Certitude, uh, and, and later as well. He says, when a manifestation is going to appear, there are two sorts of signs that precede and foreshadow his coming. One is a sign in the visible heavens, such as the star that appeared to the Magi, which they followed to discover the Christ. And a, there is a sign in the invisible heavens. Uh, now, what does that mean? Well, let's see. Examples that this, this is uh, what you're going to see now are quotes from the Book of Certitude about this very thing. Examples that Baha'u'llah gives of these two sorts of signs or proofs of the coming of a new manifestation. Among the prophets was Abraham, the friend of God. Ere he manifested himself, Nimrod dreamed a dream. Thereupon he summoned the soothsayers who informed him of the rise of a star in the heaven. Likewise, there appeared a herald who announced throughout the land the coming of Abraham. Now, we don't know much about what he's referring to here unless we study the Testaments, uh, but a lot of this is not in the Old Testament, uh, and this is because Baha'u'llah knows things that the people then did not know. So the fact that you have no uh, easy access to such things doesn't mean that uh, they didn't occur. Same thing here with this ample description of Moses. I don't think this is in the Old Testament, uh, it, and I'm not sure it's in the Quran. I didn't check. This is, again, I'm reading simply from the Book of Certitude. After him came Moses, he who held converse with God. The soothsayers of his time warned Pharaoh in these terms, a star hath risen in the heaven, and lo, it foreshadoweth the conception of a child who holdeth your fate and the fate of your people in his hand. In like manner, there appeared a sage who in the darkness of the night brought tidings of joy unto the people of Israel, imparting consolation to their souls and assurance to their hearts. To this testify the records of the sacred books. Were the details to be mentioned, this epistle would swell into a book. Baha'u'llah says this often. Uh, would I tell you more or would I tell you the whole thing? It would, uh, you, it would weary you, he says sometimes. Moreover, it is not our wish to relate the stories of the days that are past. Our God is our witness that what we even now mention is due solely to our tender affection for thee. In other words, the only reason I'm going into this history, and the same reason that uh, that I, that John Hatcher, am going over it, because I think it helps you. I think it's important for you to know it. So isn't that, isn't that sweet? Baha'u'llah has a sense of humor if you have the uh, discernment to detect it. It's throughout the, uh, the uh, Book of Certitude. Uh, and so here he's saying, the only reason I'm doing this is for your benefit. It's not really necessary, but it, but it is important uh, for us to know this. It helps uh, our certitude, which is what the whole book is about, isn't it? That happily the poor of the earth may attain the shores of the sea of wealth, the ignorant to be led, be led into the ocean of divine knowledge, and they that thirst for understanding partake of the salasbil, salsabil of divine wisdom. Otherwise, this servant regardeth the consideration of such records a grave mistake and a grievous transgression. Christ, in like manner when the hour of the revelation of Jesus drew nigh, a few of the magi, aware of the star of Jesus, had, uh, that the star of Jesus had appeared in heaven, saw and followed it until they came to the city which was the seat of the kingdom of Herod. The sway of his sovereignty in those days embraced the whole of that land. I'm not going to read the rest of this because I think you know it. Well, here, let me do this because it gets to the term uh, uh, where he interprets some things here that are important. These magi sighed, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When they had searched, and notice the footnotes here down at the bottom, that's from Matthew second chapter, second verse. When they had searched, they found out in, Beth in Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, the child had been born. This was the sign that was manifested in the visible heavens, 
as to the sign in the invisible heaven, the heaven of divine knowledge and understanding, it was Yahya. Now, Yahya is uh, Persian for John, son of Zechariah, who gave unto the people the tidings of the manifestation of Jesus, John the Baptist. Even as he hath revealed, God announceth Yahya to thee, who shall bear witness unto the word of God, and a great one, and chaste. And of course, that's from the Quran, uh, Surah 339. By the term word is meant Jesus, whose coming Yahya foretold. Moreover, in the heavenly scriptures, it is written, John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And that 65 is, should not be there. It's page 65 in uh, the book of certitude, saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. By John is met Yahya. Then Mohammed, likewise, ere the beauty of Mohammed was unveiled, the signs of the visible heaven were made manifest. As to the signs in the invisible of the invisible heaven, there appeared four men who successively announced unto the people the joyful tidings of the rise of that divine luminary. Uh, Ruzbi, uh, Ruzbi later named Salman, was honored by being in their service. As the end of one of these approached, he would send Rusby unto the other until the fourth, who feeling his death be, uh, to be nigh, addressed Rusby, saying, O Rusby, when thou hast taken up my body and buried it, go to Hijaz, which of course is the area in the Arabian Peninsula where um, uh, Muhammad was born. For there the day star of Muhammad will arise. Happy art thou, for thou shalt behold his face. And finally, we get to uh, the precursors of both the Bab and Baha'u'llah. So both the invisible or the visible and the invisible uh, foreshadowing of the advent of these twin manifestations occur at the same time. And that is you have uh, um, the visible heavens, a comet, and here I'll read you the uh, information of, uh, of, about this. As precursors of each manifestation are signs in the visible heaven and the invisible heaven. Uh, in 1845, a comet appeared soon after the one in 1843. It was called Biela Comet, Biela's Comet. It seemed to be an ordinary comet, in a year which some 300 comets had appeared, and it had appeared many times before in the past. In 1846, it was still visible. At this period in its history, it became one of the unique comets of all time. It was now entering into the last dramatic moments of its life. The Encyc Encyclopedia Britannica, now this is not from the Book of uh, Certitude, gives the following account of the event. Uh, it was found later, uh, it was found again late in November 1845, and in the following month, an observation was made of one of the most remarkable phenomena in astronomical records, the division of the comet. It put, put forth no tail while this alteration was going on. Professor Chalice, using the Northumberland, uh, using the Northumberland 19, 1846, using the Northumberland, I'm not sure what that means, was inclined to distrust his eyes or his glass. It must be a kind of uh, um, Northumberland uh, uh, observatory. Uh, when he beheld two comets, where but one had been before, he would call it, he said, a binary or twin comet, if such a thing had ever been heard of before. His observations were soon verified, however. Uh, so this unique uh, astrological event foreshadowed the, uh, the coming of uh, Baha'u'llah uh, and the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Um, the comet, I'm going to be, begin here, the comet then disappeared. It returned in August 1852. And of course, that's important because that's the same year uh, in the towards the end of that year in December, that Baha'u'llah in the Sea of Chal received the intimation of his own revelation. This was the very month and the very year in which oh, it's August of 1850. I said December. 
in which Baha'u'llah was cast into an underground prison in Tehran. This was the year 1269 of the calendar of Islam. It was also exactly the ninth year after the Bab's declaration to Mullah Hossein in the year 1260. The Bab had prophesied, ere nine years have lapsed, the promised one of all ages and all rel and religions will come. It was but a few weeks later in that same prison that Baha'u'llah's mission began. So the signs in the visible heavens, Baha'u'llah repeats this, must needs be revealed and that we have just seen. And then the signs in uh, the uh, invisible heaven. And now concerning, concerning this wondrous and most exalted cause, uh, know thou verily that many an astronomer hath announced the appearance of its star in the visible heaven. Likewise, there appeared on earth Ahmad and Kazim, these twin resplendent lights. May God sanctify their resting place. And here we get to the story then of the twin uh, uh, prophetic uh, scholars who announced the coming of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Uh, so we begin with Sheikh Ahmad Iyak Sa'i, uh, who lived, as you can see, from 1753 to 1826. Uh, so um, more than uh, uh, 80 years before the declaration of the Bab. But uh, he began the whole Sheikh E movement uh, and so let's read about him. In the late 18th century, a Shia Muslim called Sheikh Ahmad al-Aqsai set out in the prom uh, search of the promised one from Islamic scriptures. He founded a, se a sect named Sheikhi and instructed his members to prepare for the coming of the promised one of the Shiite tradition. Sheikh Ahmad and later his disciple and successor, Shiid Kazim Irashti, bought, uh, both taught a doctrine which departed from all Orthodox Shia belief. They taught that Muhammad's successor was imminent. Sheikh Ahmad's teachings emphasized the mystical dimension of faith and claimed that his authority came from a special relationship with the Imams. He attributed his visionary experiences to them. He taught that the resurrection, the night journey, and the cleaving of the moon, now these are all things associated with the, uh, the life of Muhammad. We didn't really get into the night journey, uh, the mirage, but uh, you know, that's something we skipped over, but we talked about the cleaving of the moon and the resurrection. Resurrection, But at any rate, Sheikh Ahmad taught that these were not literally true, that these were spiritual or metaphorical teachings. He died in 1826 at age 75 and is buried in Medina near the tomb of Muhammad. But he left his followers and the capable hands. And this is a, a painting from a picture of, uh, of Sheikh, not a photograph, but another picture. Uh, of Sheikh Aman. And we'll finish uh, with a discussion of Syed Kazim Irashti, because this is the uh, literal link to the Bab in several ways. So he was a follower of Sheikh Aman. Uh, Syed Kazim Irashti, Sheikh Aman's appointed successor, remained in Karbala. He taught that the promised one was already on earth. Little known to his students, the Bob was one among them. The Bob was in his classes, but at this time he was known as uh, Syed Ali Muhammad. Uh, shortly before his own death in 1843, he urged his students to disperse until they discovered the promised one. The year was 1260 in the Islamic calendar, precisely 1,000 years since the disappearance of the hidden Imam. And this, as I say here in the parentheses, relates to what the Bab states at his trial uh, in Tabriz uh, before he is executed. I am, I am, I am the promised one. I am the one whose 
Advent or coming, you have waited 1,000 years to behold. So in other words, uh, that's what he's referring to. Uh, he cautioned his students, for soon after the first trumpet blast, which is to smite the earth with the extermination and death, there shall be sounded again yet a second, another call at which all things will be quickened and revived. So the first trumpet blast, according to uh, the writings of the Quran, will cause everyone to fall into a swoon, uh, but the second one will revive everyone. So in other words, the first one is shocking. The second one is re causes resurrection and re re revivica uh, revivification. Really, I say after the Kayim, the Kayum will be made manifest. For when the star of the former has set, the son of the beauty of Hossein will rise and illuminate the whole world. Now, this is, of course, alluding to uh, Mirza Hossein Ali, the uh, Baha'u'llah. And it's also, of course, the uh, the beauty of Hossein, meaning the beauty of Imam Hossein will arise and illuminate the whole world. So he, if you want to see the uh, verses about the twin trumpet blast, this is the verse, Surah 39, verse 68. And this is a drawing of Sayyid Kazim. Now, this is extremely interesting here. Among his students were Mullah Hossein, of course, as we will, I say, of course, uh, and forgive me, uh, but Mullah Hossein, who would become the Babul Bab, and his story we will get to next week. Uh, Karat al Ain or Tahire, both of these are titles. Karat al Ain means solace of the eyes, and Tahire means the pure one. Uh, but she actually stayed in the house of Sayyid of uh, um, Sayyid Kazim uh, and learned from him. Uh, and we'll see her story later. And learn about how she discovered the writings of Sheikh Ahmad, which led her to the house and teachings of Sayyid Kazim, and how she recognized the Bab without ever meeting him by meeting him in a dream. Sayyid Ali Muhammad, the Bab himself, was one of the students. The first intimation of the Bab of his revelation. Now this, of course, is something that happens with every manifestation. Uh, they know their manifestations, even from early childhood. Uh, and there are many things to indicate uh, from the authoritative text where this indicated they know this. Uh, so what happens when they receive the intimation of their revelation, the first intimation? This is the term the guardian uses. Well, intimation means an indication or a hint or a, a sign. Uh, and it doesn't mean a sign that they are manifestations. It means a sign that in effect, you're uh, now in charge, <laughs> if you will. It's an analogy I've used in the past, and I'll end with this because uh, I think it's an apt analogy. It's to me, if you want to know, why are they so shocked? Why did the Muhammad run from the cave to be embraced in the uh, robe by his uh, wife, uh, Khadija? Uh, why is... Uh, uh, why is it such a startling, uh, have such a startling effect on them if they already know their manifestation? Well, if, if the analogy I use in my writings is that uh, if you were a runner and you uh, trained your whole life and you went to the Olympics and you had prepared your whole life for the 100-yard dash, uh, you know you're a, are a runner, you know you're a hard 100-yard uh, yard dash runner, you know that you are uh, uh, about to uh, take part in this, but once the gun goes off, then it's uh, it's your time. And to me, that's that's kind of what's happening here. They've trained, they know, they've prepared, but still, it's it's an, an incredible feeling. And we even have descriptions by those who witnessed it 
of what it was like to watch the manifestation when he was revealing verses and the uh, intensity in the room and the intensity of them and what they went through and how exhausting uh, experience it was for them, or at least that's my recollection. We'll look at some of those later. So that's, that's all for tonight. Uh, and so far as it will continue and get into the declaration itself. Uh, and uh, uh, all the events that surround that, uh, including a video of, uh, of the house of the Bob. <laughs> 